Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, talking about my book here, which is called The Battle for Open, um, as Amy mentioned. Uh, I'm an open access nut, advocate, evangelist, whatever you want to call it. So uh, I've written this book, but you can go there and uh, get it for free. So it's under a, a Creative Commons license, get your Kindle, PDF versions. But, you know, feel free to buy a version, you know, don't, don't, don't really put you off, you know. That, that, that yacht doesn't buy itself, you know. So. Uh, so the kind of theme of the book, um, and this is the Chuckle Brothers, is that uh, there's kind of two arguments really. The first of all is that openness as an approach in education has, has been victorious in many ways. It's kind of moved from being a, a peripheral, a peripheral uh, interest that just a few people are into to kind of being part of the mainstream approach. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that everyone's doing it all the time and if you stop someone in the street and ask them what a MOOC was, they would know what you were talking about. But it, it's kind of moved from being just on the outskirts and just a, a kind of very special interest to something that uh, impacts upon lots of areas of um, practice. So part of the book is exploring why that's happened and, uh, and across different areas why it's interesting. But at the same time, um, having been victorious, it's almost like now is the time that the real direction of openness is going to be decided. When it was just a peripheral interest, it kind of didn't matter. You know, no one was actually that bothered about it. But now it's actually been victorious, then it matters to people. It has commercial value. So I want to talk about that. Um, so I want to explore some of those tensions that this kind of victory brings with it. Um, and there's some kind of interesting lessons, I think, from history there. So, you know, after a lot of these kind of big historical revolutions, so the French Revolution, so, so they've been victorious, but actually it's what happens afterwards that's kind of really telling. So, and often afterwards, it doesn't feel much like victory. So if you're around in France after the French, <laughs> French Revolution, it kind of got quite grim for a while before it got a lot better. So, and actually what happened during that period was, was what actually went on to decide and determine the nature of the French Republic. So, uh, in this talk I want to first of all say about why I've used that term of a battle, because some, I think some people are uncomfortable with the kind of military language, but I think there's, there's certain things that come with that metaphor that are worth exploring. I want to take a brief kind of detour and to talk about some of the roots of open education, because it's, a, it's a quite a, a nebulous term in many ways. Uh, and then explore some, some of those battle fronts that we talk about, that I'm going to talk about, uh, looking at a particular aspects, so open access, MOOCs and OERs, and then some uh, conclusions. So why call it a battle? I think there's some things that come with that, that metaphor that are useful exploring. So if you think about what's common to lots of battles, there are, there are three things, I think, that are interesting. So often they're kind of about ideological battles. There are kind of different belief systems are coming together here. People are fighting for, their, for what they believe. Uh, and you, you begin to see that in terms of openness now. So there are different things that people believe openness should do and what openness means. And I'll talk about that later. Um, but actually, often battles are really, although they pretend to be about ideology, they're actually about money. And there's real value to be won in, around open education and education in general. And openness is often seen as a a vehicle through which um, some of these commercial interests can come into education. And lastly, there's this really interesting thing about you know, the, the phrase that the victor gets to write history. So there's a kind of a battle for narrative going on about what, is it, what happens in open education and who gets to tell that story. And we'll explore that as well. So uh, my detour is to think about uh, where did open education come from? Because um, when you talk to people about open education, they'll often have a kind of implicit definition in their head. And depending on what, where they think it came from, that will emphasise different things to them. So there are three kind of influences, I think, in modern open education. The first is where I'm from, uh, things like the Open University. You can go back further than this, and there's a really good paper around that looks kind of the history of open education uh, that goes back to like coffee shop lectures in, in Europe and things like that in the 1800s. But like, in terms of modern definitions, People often talk about the establishment of open universities as the kind of the beginning of open education. And here the focus is really on open access and open entry into education. So in order to do that, they needed to focus on teaching methods. So we had uh, distance education, part-time study, and the removal of barriers. You didn't need a qualification in order to come into education. So those were the really important things, and that allowed people who were previously excluded from education to come into higher education. It wasn't really a focus on education or content being free. It was assumed that governments would finance the systems in different ways. And then the second uh, area is the idea of uh, free, so free software and open source software. Now there's a kind of subtle distinction between these two. That the free software movement was really about a focus on rights. 
It's the idea that you could take a piece of code, adapt it, and share it with someone else. And they developed licenses to do this, the famously the, the GNU license. Um, and there's a direct link from this work into open education, because um, uh, David Wiley was one of the pioneers in open education, took the GNU licenses and, and developed the first uh, open access license based around those. And from those, we got the work that then later became Creative Commons. So there is a kind of direct thread there. But it, even more so, it's just this emphasis on reuse and on rights. Now, often wrapped up with free software is the idea of open source software. And again, it's a similar thing that you can take software code, have access to the actual code itself, and share it and, and reuse it. But really, the open source community are focused that this is an efficient way of working. So it's not really about... a, a, a a philosophical standpoint, it's just that this is the best way to work. So the kind of mantra of the open source community is that uh, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. It's just a really good way to work. And you can see that in, also in education. So before we had open educational resources, we had learning objects. Uh, and the idea of learning objects was why are we all creating the same teaching resources to teach the same thing in 10 different and 10,000 different places when we just need two or three different ways to, to teach these and we could all improve them. It's the idea that by sharing your content, you could produce better content and it'd be a more efficient way of working. I think the third uh, strand in all this is the idea of Web 2.0. It's kind of a bit of a, a term we sneer about now and perhaps mock, but it, it was kind of a, a real explosion in, in the mid-2000s. This idea of this culture of sharing, everyone just being able to share stuff instantly and open practice, put your stuff up online and have easy access to technology that was free and, and easy to use. And that kind of permeates a lot of what we think about as open education. So um, what this means is that I could give a nice clear definition of open education, but I'm going to do that academic thing and avoid it. Um, but I think you can think of it as a kind of set of coalescing principles that come out of all those different strands. And depending where you are and where you come from, different things will be important to you. And I think that's, that's important because when we go on to look at later developments in open education, it's almost like people have taken different elements of those, those roots as being important to them. So if you think about MOOCs, for instance, then it's the, the free elements that we get from Web 2.0 that's important, and perhaps the, the open entry from open universities, but less the idea about the rights for reuse that we get from um, uh, open source. So moving on to those battlefronts, the first of these is kind of a, around a battle for belief and what matters in this area. I'm going to talk about... Uh, uh, use open access publishing as an example to explore this. So it's interesting about kind of, when you think about what does openness mean. Uh, so uh, open as in, so Udacity um, were a, are a MOOC provider and there was a big kind of scandal last year, or 2012, about the, the contract that they were making other universities sign up to. So uh, Georgia Tech had one where they, they could Georgia Tech provided Udacity with content for their MOOC, but then Georgia Tech couldn't even use that content in their own courses, um, whereas Udacity could use it in any other course. And, and certainly no one else could then go off and use that content elsewhere. So that doesn't feel very open, and yet it's part of this thing called a MOOC, you know, a massive open online course. And uh, Sebastian Thrun, the founder of Udacity, famously said, although he has denied it, I think, that there will be only 10 global providers of education in the future, and he wanted Udacity to be one of them. Um, so again, that doesn't feel like openness. So, th so there, openness is just a, a kind of a route to a kind of monopoly and world domination. And just compare that with um, the definition of OERs. So this is the Hewlett definition of what constitutes an OER. It's a very broad definition, but the things they really emphasise that there's a there's a licence attached to these things that permit free use and repurposing. So that's this whole idea that you can reuse it, take it and adapt it, and it's freely available. It's kind of core of what it means to be an, o, an OER. So there's a real difference between the, the things we had on the previous slide and what we see here. So these kind of represent fundamental different beliefs, I think, about what openness gets you. I just want to talk briefly. So uh, I run this research project called the OER Research Hub, which is funded by the Hewlett Foundation. And our, our aim there was to... Um, explore some of the beliefs that people had around OERs. Uh, and so we carried out a number of surveys with informal learners, formal learners, educators, librarians. And by looking at the, the responses from those, I've, we've kind of categorised users into, into three groups. And I'm not quite sure whether they kind of form the traditional iceberg in terms of numbers, but 
think of it roughly on that level. So I think the first group are what we commonly think of as, as OER users. They're kind of OER active. They're people who are engaged with OER. They know what OERs are. They might become advocates for open educational resources. Um, and I think actually the OER community is often focused on trying to, to grow that group. And it's been very successful over the past decade or so. So there are big OER initiatives kind of around the world. And there's a big community of people trying to share stuff. So it's been quite successful in growing that. But I think there's probably a limit into how, how big that group can get. You're not going to turn everyone into being an OER active person. So you then come down, down the model, if you like. There's, there's a group of people who you might term OER as facilitators. So they have some awareness of OERs um, or open licenses, but they've got quite a pragmatic approach to them. That their OERs are important because they allow them to do something else, which is their main goal. So we worked with uh, the flipped learning network in the US. And the idea of flipped learning is that you can flip the classroom. So students go home and they usually watch videos or other resources, which are the kind of content delivery, and use the face-to-face -face time for doing interaction, discussion, engagement, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so for them, OERs are useful because if there are good quality resources that they know are reliable and that they can take freely and use without fear of being prosecuted or having to pay a fee, then OERs allow them to, to do what they really want to do, which is flip the classroom. Um, and then the last group is OER consumers. So uh, again, amongst our uh, survey respondents, we found, for instance, there was a lot of people who use OERs prior to going into formal studies. So I think particularly in somewhere like the UK, where you're going to be paying £9,000 a year, you don't want to take on that lightly. So we're finding a lot of users and students who are now thinking, I think I want to take topic X, but I'm going to go away and, and find out about it first of all. So, and, they, and they want university level resources here, because they want to know the same type of level that they'll actually be studying when they go to university. So then they study uh, some OERs before deciding to take a degree. And then once they're in a degree, we're finding quite a lot of users, uh, students who are using OER to supplement their studies. So they may be studying at one university, but watching lectures from Harvard on iTunes U whilst they're there as well. So, so for these, these type of people, they're not that bothered about licenses. They're probably not going to reuse the material particularly. But they want to know that there's good quality material out there that they can find and is of the appropriate level and um, a kind of good brand. And what happens is, I think for that first group, OER Active, um, they'll always go, that they know what openness means, and they'll, they'll look for licenses, and they want to pursue that. But I think for the other two groups, if you have things that aren't really open, you lose some opportunities. I think that flipped learning uh, group are a good example there. So you could imagine a publisher say to them, look, you know, we're going to jump to flip your classroom. We've got a nice package solution that allows you to do that. Come to us, sign up for a, a, a subscription, and we'll teach you how to flip your classroom. You have access to all these uh, resources, which are great, and they relate to, in the US, the Common Core, say, and it's a nice bundled solution. And so they do that. And for, for then for many uh, teachers, flipping the classroom becomes flipping the classroom according to Pearson's or whatever. And so before they even know about it, um, the removal of openness from that, that cycle has, has lost them a lot of opportunity before they even got, knew that they wanted to have the opportunity. So I think it's worth thinking about what does openness get you and then what you might lose from it. And I think that going back to the idea that it comes from a number of different strands, there's a number of things that it gets you as well. So there's a kind of altruistic thing about it, you know, where generally universities are part of a social good and giving away content um, freely so that you can democratise education is, is a good thing to do. So there's a kind of nice thing to do there. <clears throat> that doesn't always go so well with vice chancellors who are looking at budget lines. Um, there's the, you can take the efficiency argument from... Um, Open source, it's a good way to just kind of share resources and it's an efficient way to produce new courses. So if you want to produce a new course, take a bunch of OERs and put it into your course rather than write it from scratch. Uh, the argument of increased profile, either as an individual or as an institution, if you become known as the place that, that gives out good OERs in a particular subject area, then that raises your profile um, in terms of student recruitment. Uh, it's a good thing for dissemination. So going back to my uh, research hub project, we kind of made open dissemination a part of that project right from the start. So, we, you know, so blogging was very important to us. Uh, we have a Twitter account, a Scoop It account, a YouTube account, uh, all these things. So, and as we've gone along, we've kind of 
made that part of what we do because we wanted the, the community to come in and, and to be part of our project. Uh, and so we've released all our data openly, we developed a, an open researcher toolkit, and we ran a, an open course on how to be an, an open researcher. So openness has kind of been really key to what we do in building the reputation of that. And that's allowed for wider participation. So in that project, for instance, we started out with eight collaborations, but we gained another seven as we went along because people had kind of connected with us through our kind of dissemination practice. It can lead to unexpected outcomes. You know, as soon as you try and get involved in um, ways of collaborating and saying that we're going to have a memorandum of understanding to do this and that, then I think you tie down possible um, unexpected uses. Whereas if you release a, a, a content under an open license, someone will take it and do, do stuff with it that you didn't expect. So, uh, for instance, when we released uh, material at the Open University under the Open Learn uh, repository, someone came along, and I, I think it was China, it might have been. South America, but someone along said they were going to translate it into all our content into their language and, and reproduce it. So that saved us having to do it, and that was good. It's, you know, it's released under a Creative Commons license. They weren't selling it, so that's fine. They didn't, they didn't need our permission to do that. So that was a much easier way of collaborating, which is the last one as well, there, than us having to try and find someone who would do that for us and set up a separate thing. And it allows for innovation as well. I think a lot of the early MOOC pioneers. Um, explored this space because it was outside of the kind of formal constraints. So they, they wanted to explore what did it mean to teach and learn in a very networked world, so people like George Siemens and Stephen Downs. And, they, they, and that's, why they, that's what they were really interested in about MOOCs. And if you have an open course where anyone can come in and join in, what does that mean? Um, and so again, if you close that down, that space down, you lose some of those, those innovation opportunities. So the second area is the kind of the battle for money. Um, if we look at some of the open access stuff here, so um, open access journals, this plots the graph of open access journals and open access articles, and the statisticians might be able to uh, spot a trend there. You know, it's kind of it's uh, it's all going one way. So again, this is part of the thing about the success of, of openness, and we've developed the uh, the gold and green routes to to open access. The gold route um, says we kind of still carry on using traditional journals. And that those are funded somehow, um, and often that's through uh, article processing charges, APCs, which means that um, as an author, you, you pay um, the journal to publish it. Uh, some journals are free, so I run a journal, for instance, which Giant is free to publish in, and we subsidise that out of um, university funds. Some are, some are subsidised by professional bodies, or whatever. So there are kind of different ways you get the gold route to operate. Uh, the green route is about uh, self-archiving, so for instance we uh, um, have an institutional repository at the OU, so you can archive a version there of your, your content. So you can get to open access different routes, and these have kind of developed quite sophisticated ways of doing that, so again, that's, that, that's a kind of victory thing. And there are major policies in most uh, countries now uh, that would say that a lot of research that's, um, if it's publicly funded, then the outputs of that research need to be made publicly available. Uh, and the publisher Wiley did a, a survey last year, uh, or maybe 2013, uh, and that found for the first time ever that more than 50% of their authors had published um, open access. So again, it's kind of you're reaching that, that tipping point of, of the awareness of openness. So I think for a long time, um, publishers tried to fight open access. They could see it kind of really undermine their business models. So you can understand that why. So they were disparaging about the quality of open access publishing and stuff. But all those those indicators and those mandates and the success of it, they've got to a situation now where they, they can't fight open access anymore. So if you can't fight it, you, you know, the next best thing is to make it work for you. And so they've kind of developed this fantastic uh, thing which is called the, the, the hybrid route to open access. And it's kind of, I, I, I admire it in a way, just for its audacity. So the, the hybrid route says that you still, as an individual, you still pay a fee to have an article published open access but that journal is then still charged as a subscription rate to a library, so you're paying twice. So this is called double dipping. And we're beginning to get some uh, data come out on this now. So just for the Wellcome Trust in 2012, 2013, um, they estimated that uh, academics spent 3.88 million uh, paying to have articles published in open access journals, of which 3.17 million was then paid again by uh, libraries to have access to it. So you're paying twice that stuff. Uh, and this article over here looks at a five-year mean of uh, 
journals is found for pure open access journals. The average price per article is 1,164, and for hybrid journals it's 1,800. So, so the, the, this is part of that thing about the, the battle for open. So it's a good example of how when open access was a very peripheral interest, you know, publishers weren't that interested and didn't know about it. As soon as it moved into the mainstream, it, what openness meant became subverted because it suddenly became of value to them. There's also uh, this idea of predatory open access practice. So some of you may have had these emails from companies saying, would you like to publish in one of our journals? Um, it will cost you £2,000. And you go to the, the publisher's website and they've got like 20,000 journal public <laughs> lists. OK, you've got quite a lot of journals there. Um, and it's really just, and so it's obviously there's kind of no quality control. It's just kind of paper publishing. So the idea of changing the dynamics here has allowed in a, a, new, uh, a new practice. And just in general, moving away from open access, education is seen as kind of the next big thing for, um, for technology to get into. So there's lots of venture capitalists who want to invest in, in education. They see it as kind of an area ripe for, for disruption. And I'll talk about that in the next bit. So just there was a piece in the New York Times saying that um, a venture capitalist financing of, of ed tech startups was up 55% from the year before. So it's kind of so the, the eye of Mordor has swept around. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing to go for now. You know, they've, they've, done, they've done health, they've done anything else. So. Um, so this leads to what people have termed open washing. And there's a nice analogy here with, with the green movement. So there's a term called green washing. And the, so when, when the green movement was just kind of hippies that no one really cared about and didn't have any value, it was okay, it was on the periphery. But as soon as it became valuable and had market value, then people wanted to get a piece of it. So you, know, you often see products advertised as being natural or green and stuff. And we had the, the British Petroleum advertising campaign, which was beyond petroleum with kind of lots of green leaves going everywhere. And so it's the idea of trying to use greenness in order to sell your product. Uh, so we're seeing the similar with, with openness now. So openness has kind of market value. So Aldi Waters gives this definition. Open washes have an appearance of open source and open licensing for marketing purposes while continuing proprietary practices. And there's a nice example here. So um, uh, Udacity and a bunch of other people, Google and that, create, formed this, what they call the Open Education Alliance. And if you read that definition, it's an industry-wide alliance of employers and educators in the service of students throughout the world it provides access to cutting edge and relevant post-secondary education it empowers individuals to pursue successful careers in technology. Um, so there's nothing in there about open access, open licensing, so it's really just a way of kind of marketing the various technology and tools that those, and content that those people have. Um, and it calls itself the Open Education Alliance, so it kind of obviously sees market value in that, in that, in that openness phrase. So I think there's a kind of analogy here with, I don't know if any of you have, have been to, uh, to safari parks and you kind of drive through in your car and these, these friendly monkeys jump on board and they, they kind of look playful and you think, aren't they nice, let's welcome them in. And then within minutes they're kind of ripping your car apart and pulling the windscreen wipers off and, and hijacking it basically. And that kind of feels a bit like what's happened with the, the kind of, <laughs> these people come in looking like friendly and then before you knew it, your car was being taken apart. Um, I think it's particularly true in, in, in the, the area of MOOCs, which brings me on to the, the, the battle for, for narrative. So I, I will say I'm kind of not one of these MOOC sceptics. I'm kind of very pro-MOOCs. I think they're very interesting and fabulous thing. And I was involved in a lot of the early MOOC work. Um, so this is a Google Trends graph. So blue is um, OERs and red is uh, MOOCs. So you can see, like, you know, OERs trip along quite nicely, getting a fair amount of mention, and then from nowhere, and MOOCs and suddenly overtake them and sort of become a prominent thing. So I think it's really interesting to think about why MOOCs suddenly grabbed all that attention, why they were interesting. But just before we do that, someone recommended you should do this. If you think your topic's interesting, do a Google trend chart and compare it with Kim Kardashian and you'll find that <laughs> actually you do not compare in terms of what the internet's really interested about. So, uh, so that, let's not get carried away that MOOCs really matter. Um, so suddenly from nowhere, we had all these major MOOC providers. You know, 2012 was branded the year of the MOOCs. We had Coursera, Udacity, uh, Iversity, edX, FutureLearn. So, and that was kind of an amazing thing for anyone who's kind of worked in this field for so long, just trying to get any platform or any project off the ground. It kind of takes ages. And suddenly from nowhere, we had these kind of global providers of, of free education, which is you know, a good thing. And the, the millions of enrolments, I forget what 
uh, Coursera, which is the biggest provider up to now, but it was sort of 17 million or something. So, and, and now we do know a lot of those enrolments never actually turn into people who actually come along to the course, and even fewer have actually finished. But even so, it's, you know, it's impressive numbers. So, so there's something happening here. Um, and they managed to get major media coverage. You know, you'd be lucky to be able to get the person sitting next to you to, to listen about open educational resources. And suddenly you're being phoned up from Newsnight and there is in the New York Times to talk about MOOCs and stuff. So there's kind of real media interest in what this was all about. So all that's kind of good stuff, I think. And, and that really raised the profile of open education and online learning uh, all around. So uh, George Seaman said, if education was grunge, then MOOCs were its nirvana. They were kind of the, the breakthrough act that suddenly everyone noticed. I'll skip that one. Um, so I think there's a very interesting thing about the... So MOOCs in general, no problem with, but it's interesting about um, why that narrative was so successful around MOOCs. And I think it ties in with what you might call the, the Silicon Valley narrative, which is a kind of very tech-driven, tech-deterministic way of viewing the world. Uh, and so in the education world, there's the number of things that kind of came together. First of all, there's this commonly quoted belief... <coughs> you often see around that education is broken. It's often stated as just kind of like plain fact, you know. Um, so I don't know if any of you read the, the Avalanche report that was out last year from uh, Pearson's, which was looking at uh, higher education in the UK. Uh, and th at the start of that, they say, the models of higher education that march triumphantly across the globe in the second half of the 20th century are broken. Uh, Clay Shirky said the education space is massive, very broken. Um, there was a company called, there's a company called Degreed.com who ran a campaign that said, education is broken, someone should do something, you know, that someone being them. Um, this is my favourite quote, uh, this kind of sums up the Silicon Valley narrative, kind of in one thing really. So Sebastian Tran again said, education is broken, face it, it is so broken, at so many ends, it requires a little bit of Silicon Valley magic to fix it. You know, like, so, so that Silicon Valley would come along and fix this, this massively broken system. But they very rarely say what it is that's broken about higher education. And often when they do start saying something, what they usually mean is higher education funding is broken. Uh, which is a, a, if we, and I'm perfectly happy to have a, a good conversation about how we fund higher education, but it's a very different thing from saying education is broken. Uh, and at the same time, there's this obsession with Clayton Christensen's theory of, of disruption. So I don't know if any of you have read Christensen's work. So it was a very good work. It's his first book about disruption called The Innovator's Dilemma. We're saying that when you've got a company, you can focus on what you call sustaining technologies, which is taking the existing stuff you have and making it better. But every now and then, something comes along that's disruptive, that first of all appears not to be as good, but actually reaches a completely different audience. And uh, the, the personal computer is a really good example of that. You know, IBM were focused on making their mainframes better and better, and then the PC came along and completely changed that world. And the digital camera is a really good example, again, it kind of completely changed the way we uh, think about that, that industry. But people have become obsessed with disruption, and you hear it talked about all the time, but, and it's always a good thing for a start, you know, so this thing is disrupting the sector. Um, so education is seen as an area that's ripe for disruption. So uh, Christensen himself looked at schools and said, disruption is a necessary and overdue chapter in our public schools. Um, again, the Avalanche report justified itself by saying, Elements of the traditional university are threatened by the coming avalanche. In Christensen's term, universities are ripe for disruption. Uh, and this person was criticised in OERs because they have not mostly disrupted the traditional business model. So there, disruption is the only mark of success in many ways. It's like, so OERs might have been useful, they might have helped people learn, they might have contributed to lots of things, but because they haven't disrupted higher education, they're kind of, it's dismissed. So what this creates is a kind of... Uh, I was, doing, I was doing a Mickey take of the, of the, of the, the greed programs. They, they, asked, they asked you to hold up a photo saying, education is broken, someone should do something. So I was, uh, I was mocking their campaign there. Um, so all these kind of elements came together to create a kind of irresistible story around MOOCs, really. So we have the idea that education is broken. So there's, there's a fundamental problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and that that's very different from saying that there's opportunity in education. Because if, if education is broken, then the whole thing is ruined and you need someone to come along and fix it. Whereas if you're saying there's opportunity within education, then that's often something you might expect people inside to take advantage of. So it's a, it's a different rhetoric between kind of crisis and, and opportunity. Um, 
So it's broken, it's ripe for disruption, and disruption always requires wholesale change. It's, it's not, no one says they want to come along and make things slightly better in technology terms. They kind of want to be disruptive in that market because disruption leads to uh, a kind of monopoly often. Um, and what they always want is a, is a technological solution. And MOOCs were seen as a technological solution. So Sebastian Thrun had come from Google. And they've kind of had all these kind of fancy analytics and stuff. And then the last thing is that they tried to promote it very much as outsiders with new ideas. So particularly in disruption and, and the idea of education is broken, it's no good people within the sector kind of doing it. You need these people coming in, charging in on white horses to kind of save the sector from itself. So they'll often put up people as... Um, Thran or, or Sam Khan as people who come up with stuff and, and ignore a lot of the inconvenient history around MOOCs which was people within higher education who had actually developed them, people like David Wiley and George Siemens. And, and now we're beginning to see a very interesting thing like because MOOCs are deemed to have failed because they haven't disrupted higher education, uh, so this book out called The End of College, uh, so they're now creating a new narrative about why MOOCs failed and incidentally I don't think MOOCs have failed, I think they're this, this stuff just takes time to kind of work through and we find what it, But they failed in that it's because they set themselves up as being completely disruptive and sweeping away the whole higher education sector because that hasn't happened. They failed, Even, but they've succeeded in other ways. So this guy says, the failure of MOOCs to disrupt higher education, again, disruption is the only measure, has nothing to do with the quality of the courses themselves, many of which are quite good and getting better. Colleges are holding technology at bay because the only things... MOOCs provide is access to world-class professors at an unbe unbeatable price. So MOOCs didn't fail because they didn't have a good support model or anything like that. Um, they failed because it was us nasty people within higher education who were kind of, we wouldn't let them succeed. <coughs> so there's a really interesting thing about um, if you let other people begin to tell your story around this, then it changes from what you would, you would want. So, um, so this, again, after setbacks, online courses are rethought. So not only are we talking about MOOCs and openness, but MOOCs have now become synonymous with all online education. So you might have a perfectly good e-learning program um, that's nothing to do with MOOCs, but it gets wrapped up in this whole kind of MOOC uh, profile now. And so then people say to you, but online learning, we tried that and it didn't work. Yes. And so e-learning equals MOOCs now. And, and, you saw, and you saw this slightly also with people rebranding everything to be a bit MOOC-like. So we had Spox, which was small private online courses. Like, how is that not just an online course? So but by rebranding it kind of in a MOOC-like, then you could probably get funding for it. And I think the other interesting thing that happens around when you have this kind of big rhetoric is that it creates these kind of false dichotomies. You're kind of forced into one or two camps. So I know a lot of people who have got so fed up with the kind of MOOC hype that they've kind of become against all MOOCs or against online learning and stuff and, and it kind of forces you to go into extreme camps really. You become good versus evil unicorns kind of thing and, and there's kind of, you're fighting over here and actually the reality is always much more nuanced than that and somewhere in the middle. Uh, so I just want to, how am I some? Uh, finish up by thinking about some lessons from the, from the VLE or LMS um, which I think we can bring to this. So, uh, I was the VLE director at the Open University for a while, so I think VLEs in general were a good thing and they kind of really allowed us to move very quickly um, into e-learning adoption and they were a very useful tool for a lot of people who, for whom e-learning isn't their primary interest, you know, which is great, you know, so they're a good tool and you can have a universal system across the university and very quickly get somewhere with e-learning. But the, the problem was that we kind of outsourced the thinking about them, I think, by allowing other companies to come in and develop them. And as soon as you adopted a platform, e-learning became the platform. So it didn't become that I'm doing e-learning, it's, it's that I'm now the, the blackboard person. So, and a lot of educational technologists got caught up being the person who's in charge of running blackboard. And you get this idea of kind of a sedimentation of thought and process, institutional process, builds up around the system itself. Uh, so uh, Jim Groom and Brian Lamb uh, wrote a paper last year sort of complaining about how um, the VLE had really been the, the source of a loss of innovation in higher education and they've seen similar things happen now around openness. So they kind of le leveled five charges against it. Um, so 
the idea of kind of it privileged a technology management mindset, the idea that you had to control things that were happening with the VLE. It's called a learning management system. Um, it creates silos, so you don't so you keep people with inside stuff, they don't go out into the world and explore the ideas of openness. Um, missed opportunities, so le learners use a system which isn't really like anything else they then go on to use. So they learn how to use VLEX rather than they learn how to become proficient in e-learning or managing their online identity or uh, exploring possibilities. There's a real drain on financial and also human resources. So you've only got so much money and it, it's all going into supporting the VLE, then that's what you have to do. And you can't then do any of the, the innovative stuff that you might want to do in exploring other technologies and playing around. And the last thing they say they claim was that um, there's kind of a loss of confidence. So you have all these education technologists who are then required to manage your, your VLE system. And they kind of lose confidence then in going out and exploring other technologies and trying out other innovations. So I think it's an interesting lesson here for openness and about who owns openness. In that, that you kind of get so far by outsourcing it and that gets you a good way down the line in terms of mainstreaming, but you, that should only be the first step rather than the, the kind of end point. <coughs> so inclusion, um, openness is not just a peripheral interest now, I think kind of impacts upon lots of what we do in our, our practice, whether that's teaching, research, public engagement. Um, and it's really about a, a battle for ownership now, it's kind of who owns the, the future direction of, of, own, of um, openness. And I think it's the question to ask yourself is kind of, what can openness do for me? What's important that openness could allow, facilitate, encourage? Uh, and in order to protect that, what would I need to do? So I'll end with the, kind of the, the, the summing up bit in my book. That's it, and I ask, having won the first battle, that openness is now a kind of effective way to operate. It's essential the second battle regarding its future direction is not lost by abdicating responsibility and ownership. Uh, but then I, I wimp out, I don't actually tell you how to do that. So the, kind of, so the big question, I guess, is, is how do we do that? But I think that will vary depending on what your interests are. And just some uh, links there. That's me done.